Hello, my name is uh, Johnny Subash, and I'm part of the, the Skoll Foundation team. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to this uh, Skoll World Forum session. It's my first one. Um, and this session uh, in particular is uh, uh, called, titled Field Catalyst, How System Changes Happen. Um, this year, the forum's theme is Closing the Distance. We thought there, there was no better way to reflect this theme than to invite our um, global network to design and build a new kind of event together. So I want to share a few quick items uh, for you before we begin. Um, number one, this, this session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event. Um, please, uh, please feel free to use the chat um, to engage with each other and ask questions of the speakers. Um, and uh, after the session, please take a few seconds to complete the survey in the uh, poll tab to the right of the Hopin video screen. Um, on social media, we're using the, the hashtag, hashtag Skoll WF, a world forum, and we'd love for you to do the same. Um, we're so thrilled to be able to include this session in this year's virtual Skoll forum uh, and want to extend a special thank you to the Bridgespan, the Bridgespan group for proposing and designing it. Um, with that being said, I'd like to in introduce Leah Farnham to uh, take it away. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you all for attending today. My name is Leah Farnham. She, her pronouns. I'm a partner at the Bridgeband Group, and we are a nonprofit advisor to mission driven organizations and philanthropists. I am delighted to be joined by our panelists, M. Adams, Farhad Ebrahimi, Liz Smith and Jeru Bilimoria, who is uh, somewhere in Hopin Purgatory, I suppose, and should be with us shortly. <laughs> um, as we've heard about throughout the sessions today and, and in the plenary this morning, gosh, we are facing so many challenges, um, addressing COVID-19, defending democracy, combating racism. Just look at today's events here in the US, in Minneapolis. There is an urgent opportunity to reimagine and reinvest in more equitable systems and systems change work. But how does that happen? Who makes it happen? Today, we'll focus the systems change conversation on those uniquely positioned to effectively address population level change. These field catalysts, sometimes referred to as nerve centers, anchor organizations, systems orchestrators, are critical leaders and organizers in the collective work of building back better. We would say building back for equity. Before we get started, and thank you, Johnny, for your intro, just to orient folks to the right-hand side of your control panel, we will be um, using Slido today. I was going to say warm up the chat box with a quick intro, but didn't need to say that because y'all are already there, so thank you. Um, and I will note there, there's a tab on the far right side. It says chat, polls, people, Slido. So we will reference that Slido tab a couple times um, and remind folks to go over there uh, for a few polls that we'll do throughout this session. So let's start uh, with our first poll just to capture some of who all is in the audience in aggregate. If you go into that Slido tab and click on polls, um, please select the option that you most identify with. We're looking to, to hear who is a nonprofit NGO person, who's an individual philanthropic funder or donor, who's a, um, who works in government, who's perhaps a philanthropic intermediary. You'll see the choices there. Give folks a minute. Be sure after you click scroll down and hit send the green box on the bottom of the poll. Lots of nonprofit folks, looks like 63%, and then a mix of uh, individual philanthropists and donors, philanthropic intermediaries, media, government. Awesome, thank you. Um, so in terms of structure for this session, let's get moving. We'll start with a brief overview of the research we've been doing at Bridgeband on the unique role field catalysts play, and then we'll hear from our panel who will share their insights and experiences. Well, Wani is a significant portion of our time for Q&A toward the end. So please feel free to send questions and upvote via Slido. Um, 
We love chat and love the chat. It's really hard to moderate a Q&A via the chat. So would love for folks to go to the Slido chat box where you can upvote and, and comment um, and we can keep track of where the energy is a bit better over there. So let me start with a brief overview of our research um, on this topic. At Bridgeband, we are working towards societies characterized by equity and justice, and it is clear that our biggest social problems are systemic inequities in health, criminal justice, education. These are systems comprised of people, policies, organizations, processes, norms, beliefs, and they're clearly not achieving positive equitable outcomes. And here we are at this unprecedented moment of disruption, urgency, and opportunity. Um, and I just uh, love this quote from Arundhati Roy's essay last year. I don't think I've seen it in any of the sessions I've been to today, so let me just take a moment to read it. Um, and if you are familiar with it, like uh, soak it in again. So, Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different, it's a portal a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our databanks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Over the past few years, we at BridgeBand have studied dozens of systems change efforts. And behind the scenes, we find these interesting formations. They, they don't all look the same. Uh, we think of them as these nerve center-like entities. We call them field catalysts. And they truly make the whole greater than the sum of parts. These are the organizations that are imagining and fighting for another world. These organizations and coalitions know that we aren't going to scale our way to equitable population level change. This is collective work. We hold the term field catalyst loosely. So just a note on terminology. We generally mean the, the hub organizations and leaders who mobilize and galvanize a bunch of other leaders and organizations and groups to play different roles to solve, solve complex systemic problems, homelessness, voter suppression. Um, as we've studied these organizations, we see that they come in different shapes and sizes and formations, but they tend to have three common roles that they play diagnosing and assessing the field and really understanding what's the problem we're solving, connecting and organizing the field and its work and advocating for the field and its work. We set out to study these unique organizations to really understand what powers their work. How do they do what they do? Um, how do they do this behind the scenes work and what are the assets they bring? And our research indicates that there are four assets, and we'll hear more about what this looks and feels like from our panelists today. The first asset is a deep understanding of the problem and ecosystem. And the second is the other side of that coin, a vision for equitable and durable population level change. This understanding and vision is developed with myriad actors and groups and communities. It's not about the field catalyst defining its own agenda, but rather to hold the field's agenda and vision. And a point of emphasis here in this moment of building back better, meaning with equity, for equity, a pitfall we've seen in past systems change efforts we've studied has been visions that have not explicitly put equity at the center and, and often exclusive initiatives that have left out key groups. And those left out are often those most impacted by the problem the field is trying to solve. As Stacey Abrams um, so beautifully put it in the opening session this morning, we have to investigate these problems and solutions and look to those often in the shadows. If we actually focus on those least well served today, we may actually move toward the equitable systems change needed. Third asset is an organizer's mindset. Field catalysts are organized and they're organizers. They have these fluid ways of learning and evolving. They see the various roles and assets across the ecosystem and help the various groups to align and work in concert. They provide coordination and connective tissue. As one interviewee said, they harmonize the work. And then the fourth asset, which really um, charges the other three is trusting relationships and credibility with the leaders and groups required to achieve change. As many folks have said, this work happens at the speed of trusting relationships. And yet, here's our dilemma. Funders don't see, find, or fund this work. 
But let me first note um, a, a really special, a celebrate a really notable exception. Last week, we learned that Community Solutions, truly an exemplar of the roles and assets, these superpowers here, just won the MacArthur Foundation's 100 and Change competition and has received $100 million for their work to end homelessness. We we're like overjoyed to find this news and surprised because field catalysts don't fit within the current paradigm for most of philanthropy. Philanthropic practices tend to favor short-term projects with clear, measurable results. As one leader we spoke with said, fundraising for this emergent work is not straightforward. By the time you package it, it is iterated and changed already. And that's what makes it effective. And yet it's what makes fundraising such a challenge. Um, and yet funders need to be investing in these organizations. So we envision a paradigm shift in philanthropy characterized by at least two shifts. One, moving from funder-driven diagnoses to a vision and shared understanding shaped and affirmed by those doing the work, which means considering those with proximity to the problem as experts. And secondly, moving from what can feel like transitional, transactional relationships between funders and grantees to more intentional partnerships based on trust. So let's move into our panel. Um, our full report and an accompanying due diligence guide is available on our website Feedback we've received from funders on this research and the diligence guide is that this does feel quite different. This new paradigm is essential, and yet, what does it really take to move into that new paradigm? Looking for organizations doing this catalytic work and with these superpowers is different. It requires new mindsets, new roles, and it means funders need to get out of that driver's seat that's gotten quite comfy for so many over the years. So with that overview, let me just pop over to the Slido channel for a minute before I turn it to our panel. What organizations come to mind in your fields or otherwise as I was describing those unique roles that these field catalysts play? And perhaps what funders are boldly moving into new approaches to support these systems change leaders? Liz, why don't we get started with um, with our questions for you and maybe in the next few minutes, Jiru will be able to join. Um, so we will, just to, to run through a few quick intros for our panelists today, we'll start with an international field catalyst, Liz, um, to hear about iLines's work identifying solutions proven by NGOs that can be scaled via existing systems. Then hopefully, um, Jiru will be here and we can turn to her um, and hear about her work advocating and advancing collective strategies towards systems change through Catalyst 2030. And then M will share about her work at Freedom Inc. and as a leader in the movement for Black Lives, will wrap with words of wisdom from a funder perspective. Farhad of the Course Foundation will share about how he approaches funding nerve centers like the movement for Black Lives and others and what it may take to move the broader philanthropic sector. Thanks for those examples that are now popping into the chat. Those are great ones. So Liz, let me turn to you. In studying iLiance, um, which was one of the, the dozens of field catalysts that we um, had the privilege of studying in our research, we observed all of the four superpowers that I just described, but in particular, your deep understanding of the problem and ecosystem and trusting relationships and credibility with the diversity of key actors. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about these two superpowers in particular and how they show up in your work. Sure, Leah, I'd be happy to. But before I do, I wanna first thank you for providing this opportunity for all of us to move beyond theory and delve into the nuance of the work field catalysts are engaged in. So in terms of how having a deep understanding of the problem and ecosystem relates to Alliance's work, I think it's really important to point out that even though Alliance was founded with significant experience pioneering delivery models, and my co-founder having worked with direct service delivery for over 14 years, we still knew that we had a ton to learn from other NGOs working in eye care, as well as from the global development community. So prior to our launch in 2016, we conducted a seven month listening tour with the eye care community of practice. We were looking to understand what was working and what wasn't. We also interviewed global development leaders and organizations like Malaria No More and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And we were hoping to learn more about eradication efforts and coalition-based approaches. 
Following this consultative process, we co-authored a report with our members that was published by the World Economic Forum. Now, this report made the case that access to eyeglasses shouldn't only be considered a public health challenge, but also a global development solution. We then convened what we call pop-up working groups comprised of our members that were organized around a specific objective or recommendation from that report. Now, the outcomes of these time-bound working groups became the basis of our strategy. So here's what we learned from those conversations. 40 or so NGOs, eye care NGOs, will not be able to establish the systems required to create sustained access to affordable eyeglasses for the 1 billion people who need them. But those same NGOs have pioneered solutions that could be scaled if embedded into existing systems. We also learned that governments, accordingly, governments will need to be transformed into platforms for eyeglasses delivery. And we won't come anywhere near addressing the global unmet need for glasses without thriving inclusive optical sectors. What we learned from those convenings became the immovable core tenets of our work. Now that said, our tactics are tested and revisited on a regular basis. And that allows us the flexibility required to live into a truly adaptive strategy. So with regard to building trusting relationships and credibility, this is obviously really critical to the work we do. For Alliance, this takes place at both the country level and the global level. And that work and those relationships are mutually reinforcing. Alliance establishes country level demonstrations of our global theory of change, and we call them evidence labs. And I think this is a term we stole from Bridgespan, so thank you, Leah and Jeff, for that. These labs are proof points that demonstrate that we have scaling pathways that can absorb significant resources and be implemented at the national level. School Eye Health is in the most mature scaling pathway pioneered by our community. There's widespread consensus on best practices. There are published guidelines for successful school eye health initiatives. School Eye Health essentially involves training teachers or nurses to conduct basic vision screenings in schools with eye care professionals performing comprehensive eye exams and dispensing eyeglasses frequently on site in schools. And those children who are in need of more advanced care are referred to the appropriate facility. Now, NGOs have been utilizing this approach in, in collaboration with governments for, for many, many years. So in 2017, when my co-founder and I were connected with President Sirleaf, who you heard from this morning, and we were connected by Skull Fellow Raj Punjabi, we saw an opportunity to learn how to embed a proven solution into a government system at national scale from the start. And as a glasses wearer herself, President Sirleaf urged us to prioritize public schools. She told us that she had visited hundreds of schools while president, and she could not remember ever seeing a student in a pair of eyeglasses. And so with that, we convened Alliance members in Liberia to support the ministries of education and health in developing a phased national plan. This consortium, it consists of four INGOs, one inclusive business, and one Liberian NGO. And today, those ministries are on track to be fully operational in eight counties, representing 74% of the student population by May 2022. Now, at the same time, Alliance is actively engaged in elevating school eye health on the global development agenda. To that end, we've collaborated with the World Bank on a comparative costing analysis of school eye health. And this involved the bank surveying Alliance members to generate new data on costing. We've also worked with UNESCO to highlight Liberia as a case study on how school eye health is an important and integral part of inclusive education. And we were in conversation with the Global Partnership for Education to understand if their investment in government plans could eventually be a source of funding for this work. Now, hopefully you're about to hear from Jeru on this panel, and she was one of the first people who encouraged Jordan and I to embark on this adventure. And one thing we learned from her very early on is that we cannot be at the center of this solution. And for Alliance, this means that we need to de-risk the adoption of scaling pathways so that new actors can carry them forward. And, and you can't do that without a deep understanding of the problem and strong relationships with key actors working at both the country and the global level. Thanks, Liz. One other question for you before we um, hopefully turn to Drew. If not, 
Em and Farhad, we'll turn to our dialogue with you both and then circle back with Drew at the end. Hopefully she'll be here for the close of the panel. Um, but Liz, just one other uh, quick question for you on, you started to talk about just the, the indicators of success and what we hear from many funders is that this type of systems change work is hard to see and measure, um, which I put in quotes because I think there are pretty specific measurement paradigms in philanthropy that we need to revisit and shift. So many funders ask, how do you know if it's actually working? How do you assess progress? Yeah, well, the measurement question, it seems, it seems like that's everyone's favorite. Um, so this was a big topic for us for our first year, a very big topic. And the first thing we did at Alliance is we delved into the attribution versus contribution conundrum, as, as I like to call it. And we spent a lot of time trying to understand the distinction as it would relate to our work. Then we were encouraged to study how to measure advocacy and looked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's exploration of this. But honestly, all the theory was bogging us down. It was getting overly complicated and definitely too academic. So we scrapped it all and we opted to decide for ourselves what we think constitutes success for our organization. And at the systems level, it's remarkably simple. We think about how successful we are at influencing new funding flows. We track the number of new actors we've brought into the solution. And as part of that, we also track, act, track actors who are already engaged in the solution, and we pay attention to whether they're changing their behavior or have elevated the issue area on their agenda. We track how many governments are integrated, integrating solutions into their existing systems, and we track whether we're being successful in driving new investment to inclusive optical businesses. Now that's the highest level of measurement. If funders want detail on potential near-term change, we will draft short-term milestones, but we're always clear with funders that instead of delivery targets or even achieving those milestones, our work is in service of a learning agenda. Now, this is what makes sense for our organization. And yes, it looks very different than dollars in and glasses out. And it definitely requires more patience and flexibility, but the potential to produce lasting change is profound. And we absolutely sincerely applaud donors who are embracing the idea that in order to bring about the change we all want in this world, that direct service delivery alone may not be enough. But we also challenge you to match the boldness of that vision with the uncertainty of the route. Thank you. We'd love to pop back over to Slido for a quick poll, another quick audience pulse check um, and ask, what best describes you and your role in systems change work? Do you fund systems change work? Are you interested in funding systems change work? Are you a systems change leader? Um, and thank you, Farhad, for posting or pinning the Slido link. Um, if, if you're having trouble accessing the Slido embed as an embedded tab here in Hopin, um, you can just go to slido.com and enter event code 110876. Oh, fun. Looks like about half of you all are systems change leaders. About a quarter fund systems change work. Well, this is moving as I'm speaking. Um, some high teens percentage seek to enter systems change work using programmatic expertise. Exciting. Thanks all for being here. Um, well, as we continue to work diligently to get uh, Jeru in, we'll go from international, thank you, Liz, um, to M and your work here in the US. Oh wait, I'm sorry, folks, someone's, okay. Let's just keep moving. Hopefully Jeru will be in uh, shortly. So M is co-executive director of Freedom Inc. and a leader in the movement for black lives. Um, and Farhad is the founder and president of the Chorus Foundation and a funder of the Movement for Black Lives and a number of other field catalysts. Um, so we'll have kind of a back and forth dialogue with you both. And Em, I'll start with you. The Movement for Black Lives truly exemplifies the roles and assets of field catalysts and nerve centers. Um, would love to, to make the work more concrete um, and have you share an example or story from your work over the past few years that illuminates what the Movement for Black Lives is doing often behind the scenes, as we heard in many of our interviews, to organize and mobilize groups within the broader movement. Sure, so thanks for having me. And hey, everybody. 
Um, I use any and all pronouns said respectfully. So you can refer to me as she and her, he and him, they and them. All of that is good and affirming for me. So yeah, so I I was thinking about this question and like a million things uh, came to my mind. So I'll quickly give you a few examples about what we do together. So what holds us together and we often say, and I borrow this language from Ashley Woodard Henderson, who's one of the leadership members of the Movement for Black Lives and first black woman executive director of Highlands, Highlander Center, she says, you know, our call here, our mission here is to do together what it is that we cannot do alone. And so that really calls us in to do our best and highest work. Um, and so just some examples of what some of that work looks like together. I think about just what took place a few months ago um, due to climate crises, uh, what happened in Texas where so much snow um, fell and really caused devastation to so many people's lives. I think about the leadership of uh, Colette Pichon Battle and V Gunder who are just incredible black feminist climate leaders and they helped to organize with local organizations and made sure that over 40,000 people were called. Um, just to check on folks, how are folks doing? organizing to get water where there was not water, organizing to get people food, organizing to help support people in wellness checks to see, you know, hey, we haven't heard from so-and-so at this house, let us go and check on them. So really organizing, putting boots on the ground, um, using organizing, thinking strategically about movement building to make sure that boots could get on the ground to really meet people um, in dire times. And so there are so many examples of that kind of work that we do together, the unseen, the not, I guess, not talked about, not as broadly public facing work that happens and can only happen because we are joined together as an ecosystem and are committed and share a set of ideological values um, and practices that drive our work. I also think about um, the incredible ways that we support one another through urban rebellion. You know, I've got to tell you myself and many other leaders involved um, in the movement for Black Lives, we've been very busy um, thinking about how we're responding on the ground very, very soon to the results coming out of the Derek Chauvin trial for his murder of George Floyd and also the other things that have happened recently um, in Minneapolis. And so some of that unseen work, hours upon hours upon hours of collective study, both before the moment and even during the moment to ensure that we're moving collectively in the strongest strategic way. It is direct support to organizations on the ground. And I want to say we're the people giving the support are the organizations, right? There is no invisible army. The same 160 member organizations are the ones showing up and doing this work with one another. So there's a different kind of weight to it. So giving support to organizations on the ground, whether that is extending people power, strategy power, resources, food, time, capacity, sharing in collective action, targeting uh, targeting um, officials together, proposing legislation, fighting for policy together. It's quite a number of things um, that we've done. And the other thing that I'm really excited about um, is not only do we know how to come together in these really big moments of mobilization that call us in because of intense crises, we also know how to plan big things together and execute high level organizing projects. So very shortly, we're gonna be launching our local power project. And our goal is to ultimately be in 20 to 25 sites. So those can be cities or rural areas, regions in which we're working with local Black organizations, members of the Movement for Black Lives to engage in campaigns that seek to weaken the prison industrial complex and build up the alternatives that our communities deserve. We'll also be engaging in some leadership development work. We'll be doing some um, mass organizing in those sites and mass engagement work nationally to talk to as many folks as we can about the incredible work and in moving toward uh, abolition. So those are just some examples, just a few examples of how we think about how to leverage our power with one another and how we, the organizations, put our boots on the ground collectively to advance um, as much work as we can as a unit. Thank you. What powerful examples and so incredibly timely. Um, Farhad, let me turn to you. Uh, many funders ask us how you actually find, understand, support these organizations. What's your approach? 
Well, first, I just really want to appreciate being on this panel with M because, you know, if folks are tracking what's happening in the United States right now. The, the folks at the Movement for Black Lives are, are, are very busy in anticipation in terms of what might be right around the corner. Um, and so just really appreciate you joining us today, M. Um, in terms of the, the Chorus Foundation's approach, I want to start by naming that our approach has evolved over the past 15 years. Uh, we started with you know, what you might consider a traditional issue focus on climate, but really shifted to an overall framework around building and shifting power. And that's not just the framework for what we fund, but it's also the framework for how we fund it. And ultimately, um, how we think about challenging our role and our legitimacy as a philanthropic institution. Uh, so in terms of what we fund, our grantees are organizations and efforts that are building and shifting power in communities that have historically had power wielded against them. Black folks, indigenous peoples, immigrants and refugees of color, and working class folks more broadly. Uh, they're building and shifting political, economic, and cultural power for transformative systemic change. And many of our grantees frame that question of systemic change in terms of just transition. Uh, the idea that systems change all the time, but while transition is inevitable, justice is not. Um, and the way I like to put it, if you're getting thrown under the bus, you don't really care if it's solar powered or not. And so these are the, the folks that we support, but like I said, it's not just who we fund, it's how we fund. Um, I wanna start by acknowledging that funders have a tremendous amount of power. We don't always wear it very well. In fact, I'd argue that, that we have a lot of challenges holding our power accountably. And, and, and the name that what is, I think for some, an uncomfortable truth that philanthropy itself is often one of the biggest obstacles to transformative work. It is possible, in fact, to fund the right things in the wrong way. So what do we aspire to do instead? Uh, I think of it on a spectrum from holding power accountably to equitably to seeking ways to hand over power entirely. And so when I say power accountably, I mean what folks may associate with trust-based philanthropy, building open, honest, trusting, and even vulnerable relationships with grantees and community members, uh, things like making long-term unrestricted commitments to organizations. But when we start to talk about sharing power equitably, uh, for me, that's about co-designing tactics, strategies, and processes with grantees and community members, but also building processes and structures for democratized decision making. So that the, the decisions around resource allocation, around investment, are made by folks in community, that it can become an extension of community self-determination. But ultimately, all of this is in service of, this is a line of inquiry towards finding ways to hand over power entirely. For us, that means we're spending down our endowment. Uh, it also means that we're comfortable making what are sometimes called equity grants, um, supporting grantees to acquire land, to buy buildings, to acquire the means of production. Um, you know, a, a transition of not just a consumptive economic resource, but a productive one that makes those grantees that much less dependent on philanthropy moving forward. And ultimately, supporting the creation of alternate infrastructure for resource allocation and investment that's held by the community and will ultimately outlive the foundation itself. And that is our ultimate interest in the concept of field catalysts, regardless of whatever name or framework we use to describe them. Um, that if we believe the social movement slogan that another world is possible, what does resource allocation look like in that world? What are the most transformative next steps that could credibly move us in that direction? We're learning with our grantees. Um, in some cases, they've directed our attention to infrastructure that's already been built from the bottom up. In other cases, it's been our line of inquiry that's galvanized a process to create something new. Um, and I think ultimately, as a private foundation, we see ourselves as a transitional form. If we seek to support transformational work, then we ourselves must be open to transformation. It's, it's that just transition lens, but applied to the philanthropic sector itself. And to do this, we must directly challenge the assumptions that undergird private philanthropy in the first place. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if, if, you know, making democratic decisions about money, it's hard work. Uh, our current system don't allow us to exercise those muscles very often. And so as a private foundation that's effectively trying to put not just ourselves, but our entire sector out of business, right? Like that's the vision. It's not going to happen necessarily in my lifetime but the vision is a world in which the resources are not extracted and consolidated in the first place. And I think that field catalysts can be an example of the butterfly to the caterpillar of the private foundation if we really support them to take on this kind of work in terms of determining how resources are allocated. 
By the way, folks, Farhad has a way with metaphors. So uh, <laughs> you have a lot of good ones. Um, the other one that I, I tend to quote you on is uh, philanthropy tends to fund um, like fantasy baseball, looking at the stats, but we approach it like just got to go to the park and play catch. Um, love, love that vision. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, and let me pop back to you for a minute. You know, one of the incredible, I think, uh, parts of the Movement for Black Lives approach is both holding that big vision for Black lives and Black liberation, and also an adaptive agenda that has more concrete pillars. And with the alignment of over 150 members, um, what does it actually look and feel like to manage this? How are decisions made on things like priorities or resource allocation? Give us a bit of a, a feel for what the, the work actually looks and feels like, so to speak. Uh, that's a big question. It is um, a mighty project um, for sure. So, you know, we really strive to build and operate with the structures and the practices that we want to have reflected in the broader world. And so sharing power is extremely important to us. And, um, you know, we have three ideological pillars. So one of them is black queer feminisms. Uh, the other is abolition and the other is anti-capitalism. And because I mentioned those to say they guide how we practice things with one another. So as feminists, we think a lot about how we share work responsibly. We think a lot about how to, um, we think a lot about how to care for one another. We think about the care economy, right? Somebody's doing the labor of making sure that somebody's okay and that people can show up and be the full selves. We think a lot about, um, ensuring that particular, all different types of labor are being valued and a host of other things. And so because we are thinking about this critically, we really do a lot of work to democratize this decision-making. So we don't wanna replicate structures that have led to just a few, right? A rule of a few. So we do a lot to create structures where as many organizations as possible can have meaningful input in decision-making about the projects, priorities, and the decisions of the ecosystem. And so currently the way that we're structured and have been structured for many years is we really rely on a table structure. So we have different tables, which are basically coordinating spaces, if you will, or spaces where organizations come together and focus on a particular strategy. So we have policy table, a base building table, electoral, abolishing patriarchal violence, mass engagement and cross movement. So these tables are how our members join and participate and work together. The tables have a lot of power. The tables are where the work happens. The tables are where the organizations show up and say what they wanna work on. And so the tables decide, um, First of all, the membership decides like, oh, you know, we do want to work on these particular areas. And then membership uh, determines what the work of those tables are. So it is the members, the people, the organizations on the ground, the organizations advancing the work are the ones who say, yes, we want to do local power, for example, or yes, we want to do leadership development work. And here is how it's going to look. And they engage in a democratic process to determine the priorities. In order for us to act as a whole and not just a group of siloed tables, what then happens is there's a leadership team chosen by those tables that comes together to facilitate coordination across the ecosystem and shared decision making. And so that space is really important. It's how we it's how we assure that we're moving in the same direction or a similar direction um, as one another. It's also how we leverage ecosystem-wide priorities so that we can have our biggest impact together. And similarly, our budgeting process mirrors that. So as big and perhaps as full and robust as that structure sounded to determine what project we were gonna do, is as big, is as full and as robust as our budgeting process. So it is not a fast process. <laughs> so it is not something that we that is determined overnight. It is something that takes a few months for us to do because it requires that each organization has uh, opportunity to weigh in on the table's work and determine um, what they think is the priority of that. And then uh, 
codify or translate that some way into a budget. And then the leadership of those tables come together and develop a shared budget to say, all right, so your table wants this, your table wants this. Where we, where do we have overlap? Where do we share priorities? Or what are the things that we cannot prioritize perhaps because we don't have resource enough? So it's quite a robust and big and full process, but we think it is the right way to do it. We want it to be democratic. We need the organizations and the people on the ground who are driving the work to decide where the resources to flow. We think that should also happen in society. And so um, we err on the side of um, involvement and accessibility, um, even if it takes us more time to do it. But that means that our work or the end product is just that much stronger. Thank you. Powerful and concrete examples. Um, thank you so much for that, Em. Farhad, let me turn back to you. And I will note in the chat and in the Slido, there are a number of questions that perfectly tee up this, this second question that we have for you. Um, and you know, I will note that in our research on field catalysts, and many of you in the audience who identify as field catalysts, I suspect this is not surprising, but these organizations are routinely underfunded. As I said before, they're not seen or funded um, and, and certainly not at the levels necessary to do the full breadth and depth of work. Uh, and funders name a set of barriers that we would probably call kind of technical barriers like measurement or looking for specific areas of focus aligned with their specific programmatic angles or strategies. So Farad, tell us, what will it take to shift the sector such that more funding flows to leaders like M and Liz and Drew, who we'll hear from next? Well, I, I, I spoiler alert, it's, it's more than just the technical barriers. I mean, uh, of what I shared earlier, a lot of it was not particularly new. I mean, the critiques of the philanthropic sector are not exactly a secret. Uh, many of us can recite the list of best or alternative practices from memory. Um, but the fact is knowing what we can do differently, those technical things, while clearly necessary, remains woefully insufficient. And so the question of how do we actually bring these practices into being, I think the philanthropic sector tends to take a sort of information deficit theory of change approach. You know, they would behave differently. And while information, uh, data, et cetera, is certainly useful, uh, the merit of a information deficit approach have clearly been grossly overestimated. And so I believe the real challenges are both cultural and structural. The culture or cultures that inform how we approach our work and then the structures that make it hard for us to change. And so at the end of the day, I think it's really about naming and then challenging the ecosystems of power within our own sector. We talk about organizing, we talk about building power, philanthropy as a landscape is very similar. And, and to do that, I think we need to get serious about funder and donor organizing, which I wanna be clear is more than fundraising uh, or persuading folks. Um, those are important things, but like a, for me, a working definition of organizing is developing leadership to shift power for structural change. And so if we're talking about funder organizing, we're talking about shifting structures and cultures within the philanthropic sector and within specific philanthropic institutions. Um, this, I believe, needs to be informed by and accountable to all the pre-existing organizing efforts that folks like M are doing. Um, but it does require that we take seriously the idea of building a base within philanthropy itself. Uh, and I'll say, just as an aside, I think all of this applies to the investment world as well. I want to highlight the importance of leadership development in all of this, that good organizers develop the leadership of other organizers. It's not just a question of getting stuff done, getting the grant made, getting the funds set up or whatever it is. It's about developing and democratizing leadership. That's how you really build and shift power. That's how you really start to see philanthropic institutions change or see larger trends within philanthropy. And so funder organizing isn't just about developing better grant makers. It's about developing more powerful leaders who are funder organizers in their own right. Um, there's also, I think, a distinction between an, an internal and external organizing and philanthropy. It's very popular to talk about moving the field, uh, yet rarely do we talk openly and honestly about moving our own organizations. And after all, our own organizations can be deeply contested spaces, right? Like knowing what you can do differently only gets you so far if your boss or members of your board don't share that assessment. 
Um, there can be real risks in pushing for transformative change within one's own organization. People can and have lost their jobs over this kind of thing. And I think we need to be honest about that, that if we're smart about the risks and how we behave as an ecosystem to try to shift the practices of specific philanthropic organizations, we can see internal organizing is involving uh, you know, power mapping our workplaces, determining the nature and the location of pockets of power and developing sophisticated strategies to build and shift our own power in response. Having the technical stuff in our back pocket is useful. Having the data in our back pocket is useful. But if we don't have a real organizing strategy within philanthropy, I think we're always going to be wondering why we made such good presentations, like a lot of the ones that are happening here this week, and people nod their heads, and then they go back to their respective philanthropic institutions and nothing changes. So we need to pull back that curtain and ask, really, how do we support each other? And how do we name that you know, philanthropy, as much as we might try to present ourselves as sort of above the fray and non-ideological, that actually these are deeply ideological contested spaces where the same kinds of challenges that we talk about happening in social movements and community organizing are happening within our institutions. And we need to support each other to engage with that. Thank you. I suspect that as I see the, the chat blowing up and there's just a lot of energy around some of the ideas that you just put forth, Farhad, and so thank you. I wanna come back to that. Um, and first invite Drew into our conversation. Hi, you made it. Drew, I'll have to download the full chat for you. You should see all of the folks trying to get you in during the last 30 minutes. You're here, welcome. And um, Drew is in Amsterdam, so it is the middle of the night for her. Um, thank you for, for being with us. Um, Drew is a social entrepreneur and founder of many international NGOs and initiatives and including serving as a leader of the Catalyst 2030 global movement. Um, Drew, as you, you enter the space, uh, you just heard some of Farhad's comments about the role of philanthropy and funders in this moment. Um, I, I would love to start, I wanna come back to that, that with you as well, as you've thought about the role of philanthropy as part of the Catalyst 2030 set of pillars. But first, um, let's just get you into the panel with some of your own lessons and insights from your own journey as you've moved from being an individual social entrepreneur to really thinking about systems change. What does that mean to you? How are you now focused on this notion of systems change? So basically, I think if I will start for myself as an individual entrepreneur, I started with what most of, we have an idea, and then you want to scale the idea. But my journey in systems change uh, started with saying I could reach X number of children with child helplines, but that's not going to help. And if we really want to do something, then you need to change the whole system. Therefore, partnering with the government of India, therefore trying to change the whole child protection system and working to make that happen. But more importantly, I'm sure Liz mentioned to you about how I Alliance has worked and how you're able to change systems with I Alliance. And with Catalyst, what we chose to do is that there are many people like me who've tried to change their systems on their own. There are people like I Alliance who've done it by another issue. So with Catalyst, what we've tried to do is get all the issues together and try to jointly change the meta system. And I see several Catalyst members who have probably been rolling their eyes over here from Jim to Lewis to Janet to several people. And the Catalyst is about all the social entrepreneurs coming together to try to change the system and the overall larger system that they want to do. For myself, I have been able to see that you can't do it alone. You have to do it together to make the systems change happen. Sorry, I'm jumping into the conversation. I don't know what has happened. So I may be a bit off tangent, but hey, I'm trying to get into the flow. Apologies. No, thank you. I know that's tough, especially after battling with the technology for the last 40 minutes. <laughs> thank you, Drew. Um, and would love just one more minute from you, Drew. You've thought a lot about um, the role of funders and for how to use the phrase funder organizing um, and Drew as you think about the work of Catalyst 2030 would love your take on the role of funders how funders need to show up this notion of funder organizing but also 
are there bright spots? Are there funder leaders that we should be looking to in particular for the international work that you've been doing? Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, probably Farhad, and I don't know if you've talked about Embracing Complexity, which was a publication that all the social entrepreneurs with Ashoka, Skoll, Schwab, Echoing Green, we did together, where basically social entrepreneurs talked about the challenges they have, but we also came up with principles which could work together to help accelerate systems change. And I think that is what is important. And one of the pillars in Catalyst is basically shifting the funding paradigm. And we need to be able to work jointly to shift the funding paradigm by A, I think the biggest feedback from everyone was no short term grants, you know, B, if possible, common applications for 10 funders. If you have 10 applications, it's difficult. C, then you talk about the same thing, 10 types of evaluation. So some common paradigms. So I think what would be really, really nice is funders could get together, but not on their own but in collaboration with entrepreneurs. I think currently what's happening is there are lots of dialogues happening between funders. There are lots of dialogues which are happening with social entrepreneurs, but I think the true systems change in this area will come and the true paradigm will shift will come when we all start working together and co-creating. And catalysts, we're trying to sort of initiate that and work towards that. So I think that's what's going to happen. So let's not have funder organizers, entrepreneur organizers, let's have it all together. Co-created systems change for funding, you know, and jointly we shift the funding paradigm. And I think that's what is really, really needed. Farad, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear all your comments, but this is where I'm coming from. So apologies, but yeah, this is where we look at. Well, perfect segue back to you. Um, and I think the uh, the th common theme with what you were sharing earlier about really being in and what you were just saying, Drew, being in partnership, being at the park playing catch, um, how you as a funder actually show up and, and enter into those spaces. And then Em and Liz would also love to hear from you. Oh, thank you, Brad, you just put in the chat. Would also love to hear from you all. What are the most productive and supportive ways that funders can and should be showing up for your work? So Farhad, did you want to start us in there and then we can go to Em and Liz? Well, I just uh, want to, under it's such a simple thing to say, but want to underline, I think, how important taking a, a relational and trust-based approach to philanthropy can be. Because I think, for example, you know, looking at the Slido, 77% uh, of folks, right, said that one of the biggest barriers was around approaches to, to impact measurement. And I think one of, one of the challenges with, um, a sort of more mainstream technocratic approach to philanthropy is, is is me as the funder believing I have to be one of the smartest people in the room and I have to come up with or embrace these metrics that are then going to have a transformative impact. And I think for me, like a, taking instead an approach of, of a sort of um, a radically humble line of inquiry that why, you know, why do we want to measure impact? We want to learn from and understand the work. We want to know that it's effective, but so do our grantees. So why don't we start by asking them how they learn from and understand their own work? And instead of putting the onus, as Jayru was talking about, for uh, as, you know a single organization to have to understand all the different applications and all the different metrics of all their different funders, why, why don't we put the onus on me that I have to understand all our different grantees have different ways of talking about their work and different ways of understanding if it's working or not? That that should be my job instead of trying to be the smartest person in the room and determining the right strategies and tr treating grantees like like service providers if i'm actually out there and building relationships and building relationships like as as a whole person right when we when we talk about trying to move board members um my best example in terms of around po what political education looks like for my board members is them at the eastern kentucky social club which is which is a um essentially like a, a, a longstanding black social institution in Eastern Kentucky, uh, sampling local moonshine and listening to old labor songs on a banjo, like bringing my board members into a position like that where they're actually spending time, not just with the executive director of our grantees, not just with their staff organizers, but with the members in community 
and spending time as whole people, I think that's actually really, really important. And there's an alternate approach to philanthropy, which I have a lot of critiques of, that is very button up and professional and says it's inappropriate to do that. How, how you know, sitting around drinking moonshine with community members, like you do that on your own time. I actually think it's part of our job because if we don't build those kinds of relationships, we're not gonna hear about the work in a really sincere and authentic way. And also we're not gonna get the crit critical feedback when we're making mistakes. Um, a huge part of my job is hearing when we've messed something up, right? Like I think one way to build trust is to say what you're gonna do and do it perfectly. Another way to build trust, say what you think you're gonna do, fuck it up entirely, and then handle it well when it's pointed out to you. Um, and I think with the amount of power that we hold in philanthropy, that's the kind of work we need to be doing. And that involves an amount of humility and vulnerability and emphasis on relationship and trust that is just not part of the dominant culture in the philanthropic sector. Um, let me turn to you. We'll also just add a thank you, Megan, for the question in the chat. Would love to hear more about what's been helpful or unhelpful in engaging funders in this work. Where have you seen positive change or response on the part of funders? Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. So a couple things come to mind. So one, I think it's all the stuff that you all have probably already heard and discussed, which is like, give it unrestricted general operating, make it multi year, give a good amount, like, you know, all of those things. In addition to that, there's a few other things. One, I think, you know, I remember what it was like when we were a much scrappier organization, Freedom Inc. And it was really difficult. Um, for us to secure funds. I think this is a time, especially with the flowering, if you will, of new organizations that have been that have been and are being developed out of response of these mobilization moments for funders to be um, more willing to, and I don't want to call it taking risks, but more willing to invest um, in new organizations forming and scrappier grassroots organizations that are sprouting and taking ground for, for funders to get up under them and offer support, right? It's almost like you have to go through years of proving yourself in this really difficult um, resource lacking years in order to get resources enough to, you know, lessen some of the burden. And I wonder about how much talent we lost that couldn't weather that storm. And I wonder about how much work, more work could have happened had funders been willing to, to make the investments at an earlier stage. And I think that that is really, really um, important to do. I also think, you know, funders should reassess what they think their dollar amounts can do. You know, I was I forget um, who said this, but I, I wish I did know to accredit them that, with this, but they asked the question, well, how much do you really think it costs to get justice? And that's a different orientation around the dollars. So often those of us on the ground are really thinking about um, or forced to think about how much how many meetings can I get out of this dollar, right? Like if the funder is only going to give me X amount, how many meetings can I turn this into? How many programmatic events that I can turn this into? And the, of course, us as movement scientists and strategists on the ground, we want to maximize our impact. So we do think about efficiency when it relates to capital. And I think funders need to pivot, right? I think, you know, folks are asking us to take on an empire with $50,000, like, how did you think I was going to do that? Right. And so I think some of it is like there's a there's a challenge for philanthropy to reassess what they think are realistic commitments or good investments into these organizations to take on the work. And I say that because we pay the biggest cost. Right. When I think about the human cost of the work, outside of I think of my personal life, my staff's lives. Right. Like, mom, you know, I, I buried my mother with nothing while I was leading a grassroots movement. Right. So I, I think about that. Right. It's like, how do we pay the full human cost of it? And this is an invitation for funders to show up in a different way. Right. But to really to really give more is what I'm really trying to get to, to give more because we are uh, taking on something that um, in some ways is really difficult to assess a numerical value or dollar amount, how much it actually costs to take down white supremacy. But that is what we're seeking to do. We put our lives on the line. We face many threats. Our communities are under constant attack, et cetera. And so we need more support or members need more support. Communities need more support to really take on the work in a different way. 
Um, and the other thing that I'll say is I appreciated what um, Jero was, was getting to, which is re, and even uh, Farah was hinting at this, but reassessing how people are able to request to submit for funding and also how people can report and share back on their work, right? I think about this, you know, we're potentially heading into another wave of mass mobilizations. And I would think that funders would want my talent and time to be focused on the ground and not in a bunch of meetings trying to explain why me and other black organizations in the Midwest should be rapidly funded so that we can scale up very quickly to meet the moment. Um, but so also often so much talent is taking during critical times. And then we're in these cycles of trying to say, hey, resources when we're already demonstrating the work. I mean, what, 26 million in the streets? I mean, come on, right? So I think we're already demonstrating the work. The campaigns are there, the wins are there, the leadership is there. Um, and so I think there, you know, I really am urging and, and encouraging people to do rapid response. And the last thing I'll say, I have seen TMF, um, so Borealis take on a funding model that I actually thought was really helpful, right? Like they, you know, you can just do a call and that's like your, that's like your uh, application request. And also you can submit the report that way. What's also really helpful with them is when they fund, they give you the general operating programmatic amount, but then they also give you these two other smaller pots of money. And one, they say, this has to go to leadership development for somebody. That's actually really important because so often when we think about money, we think it directly, how does it go into community to turn out important campaigning work? But then we never really take the time to do the leadership development we need. Through that experience, I was actually able to get a coach. I had never had a coach in my life, right? But with them saying, no, this $4,000, you got to use it for leadership development in addition to the money that went into the organization was actually really helpful. And they also offer resources for organizational development. So I think if funders really want in, to invest in strong organizations, give what you were going to give for general operating and then give other money, additional money to support organiz organizational development money and also leadership development for people leading the work because we don't take that money out of their general operating. If folks are on the ground and committed, they're, they're putting all of that money into the field. So I think those have been some important practices. Liz, in terms of how funders show up, how funders are supporting your work. I think one would be curious, anything that I'm sure everything that, that M and Farhad said resonates from the, my own conversations with you about this work, anything you'd add. Then there's also a more specific question about, do you get pushback from funders on the type of measurement approach that you just described? And is that enough? Like how, how is that working in particular in your relationship with funders? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, of course, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. In terms of the funders, I mean, the thing I would just add, and, and it's interesting to hear everyone, I would encourage them to dive in, start making some investments. Think of them as, think of them as learning grants. Um, standing on the sidelines, listening will only get you so far. And most of us, if you're, you know, if you're on this, if you're listening to this panel, most of us are eager to learn alongside you. And then I think it's important um, to decide if you're in or if you're out. Does this work for you or doesn't it? And I think that that's, I think that's a critical, um, I would just encourage donors to really just, you know, the dialogue's important, but just start making some grants and, and see how that fits for your organization. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, in terms of the, the measurement, I, I think these two things are linked because we're fortunate that our funders that we do have um, are in it to learn with us. And so when we made that statement about, um, you know, we were trying to contort ourselves and we were taking in all this sort of academic discussion about measurement and we did just decide what made sense for us. And then we shared that with them. We've not received pushback from our existing funders because that's interesting to them. OK, you know, this is one way to think about it. Right. And, you know, as we all know, everyone thinks about systems change a little differently. And so it was important for us not to try to to stray too far from our work. Right. And, and to really it was meaningful for us to define success for us at the beginning. And so I think they've responded well to that. Now, I think on the other hand, um, funders who haven't funded us, I wouldn't say pushback, but I, I think, I think I, I, to be honest, sometimes I feel like it's almost, um, I don't want to say an excuse, but it just seems like a conversation we've had a lot. And I don't, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a struggle we're having on both sides, but I don't think we've received pushback per se, but I do think 
that there's the funders who are wanting to learn and, and they embrace what, what we've come up with. And then there's funders who are still trying to understand it or see if it's for them. You know, is this really where we want to go? And I think that that's where some of those dialogues haven't been as um, not as smooth or maybe not as, as flexible um, in the thinking. So, yeah. Thank you. There are a couple of questions in the chat and in the Slido um, that I think build on this conversation we've been having about the role of funders. Daru and Farhad, your points about co-creation, being in it together. Liz, what you just said about dive in, let's learn together, let's do this. There are a number of questions about the power dynamics and managing an equitable power um, and an imbalance in power in particular uh, with funders at the table in the work. Um, and Drew, I'd love to circle back to you to hear more about how are you thinking about doing that work together with the philanthropic community and with a bunch of social entrepreneurs who each have different ways into the work as well. There's kind of different layers to that, that power dynamic question. How do you think about your role? I know you're playing a kind of connective tissue role yourself. How do you think about managing power dynamics and what are some, some practical words of wisdom perhaps for the audience? I think there is a power. The donors have money and you want the money. And I think uh, we can address that if it's a two-way conversation. And I think just now that two-way conversation is not taking place as equals. And that is where the biggest uh, tension comes in the sector. In embracing complexity, more than 90% of our social entrepreneurs had to rework their proposals to be with donors. So I think addressing that and trying to shift that is one way. In Catalyst, some of the things which social entrepreneurs did is, and have done is A, Gurpreet, whom I saw somewhere earlier, along with some other social entrepreneurs, have worked for donors to have a self-regulation tool to see are they really systems change donors? Are they really equitable? So one is empowering donors in their own thinking process. And there can be courses to do that. Maybe we already have one, but maybe we can work to create. So that's one way. The second is we actually experimented with having donor awards and trying to shine light. Now, Farhad, nobody recommended you. You should have been an ideal nominated candidate for us. So next year, for sure, you'll be there, I'm sure. But I think it's a nice way to highlight donors who are doing things positively. So we were able to get that, and we have Catalyzing Change Week coming up, 4th to 7th March, where we are highlighting some of those donors and positive examples. So we can start hopefully having role models like Farhad, like Tim, who I saw in the conversation earlier, like Skoll, talking about how they are th doing things differently and then making the shift happen. I always believe that, yes, you can keep criticizing, but that doesn't get anywhere. So why not work proactively and positively? So the strategy Catalyst is using is, we will work positively, shine light on those who are really bringing about the change, and then ask everyone to co-create with us so we can change the ecosystem because otherwise this broken ecosystem will not work. So I think that's what we need to work towards. And hopefully after this session, we'll have more of that. Farhad, you're definitely going to be roped into Catalyst. You realize it, right? <laughs> So I think that's where I would say the three or four practical tips which come in. Let's positively co-create. Let's try to shift the bio dynamics by shining a light. And let's give donors tools where they can have the self-reflection. But also let's create practical tools and offer them to donors. Like say, just one application for all of us. You know, and what you were saying, we'll provide the evaluation criteria. Let's build on it. So that sort of slowly but steadily brings about the shift that we hope to see. So this is what I would suggest. Thanks, Drew. Well, I'd love to, to have um, 
open it up for a, a closing thought from each of our panelists. And you can take this broad, this broad prompt as you will. Um, but having gotten to share your ideas, heard from each other, the really active and dynamic chat that we have going and lots of resources and ideas being shared there. Would love to have you each um, pause and, and share something that you would either pose to this audience as a provocative question or push. Um, we've talked a lot about the role of philanthropy uh, and I think talked to different levels about the big paradigm shift, but also just some of the more practical and concrete ways in um, that Drew, you were just naming. So I'd love to, to hear what's a headline takeaway or burning question on each of your minds, um, or even just you know a parting word of wisdom, because we could, I would love to hear from you all all day long. Um, so I've been kind of rambling this question, giving you a moment to think of of that last thing you might want to say. Um, do I have a volunteer to go first? Or how do I feel most comfortable calling on you? You've always got got a good word to end with. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, the thing that I would say is, is um, in the same, just on the question of shifting philanthropy, in the same ways that we talk about how philanthropy needs to be patient and support emergence and really, um, you know, not try to give the money while holding on the power, but really invest long term. I think we also need to invest long term in trying to shift our own sector. Um, and we need to be patient there and we need to commit to it long term as well, because I think what often happens is um, we have moments of intervention, we have momentary shifts. But if we don't do that day to day organizing work, we're never going to be able to move the resources in the ways and at the scale um, that the folks on this panel and others really need to support this kind of work. So it's both embracing long term work on the ground, but also long term transformational work happening in our own sector. Love that. Um, okay, I'm going to go in alphabetical order by first name. So, Jeru, you're up next. <laughs> Um, for me, I think um, the shift should come. It's not you or us. We want to bring about systems change. So let's change the system we are operating in by being a we. So co-creating, working shoulder to shoulder and solving the problems together. Because only if funders, governments, everybody, but especially funders and operate, uh, entrepreneurs come together, will we be able to tackle the problems that are there today? So my simple word is not you, not me, we. We together bring about the shift we want to see. So that's, that's it, I'll say. Liz? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I heard someone a few years ago say that, and I think this is relevant since we're at the Skull World Forum, I heard someone say that in order to be a successful social entrepreneur, that you need just to be a little bit arrogant. Um, and I'd say the opposite is true in this work. Um, and it really, what Jeru was saying really resonates. I, I think the opposite is, is true and you won't get far without humility and listening, really listening. Um, I think that's really important for people to take away. And I think the other thing um, that, I, that I feel like you know, I think is worth is worth taking into consideration when you're embarking on this work is is to not get too caught up in in the theory or the structure, or certainly not how others others think you should should work or how how it should look. Um, if you have a deep understanding of the problem and the ecosystem, set your north star, sequence the work, and set sail. I think that's it. Yeah. And I'll just underscore um, something I brought up in my last comments. I'm again borrowing the words of comrade Ashley Woodard Henderson, who says, fund us like you want us to win. Um, I see this as an opportunity as landscapes are shifting, shifting in a number of sectors for it to shift within uh, philanthropy. And I just wanna highlight just some of the impressive work of movement, right? So. Organizations have done incredible work of turning states blue. 
organizations have changed the national narrative just within five years. Um, people have gone from thinking that the issue with the police should only be um, improving body cameras to now saying defund, right? That kind of ideological shift doesn't happen. Um, typically doesn't happen within five years. It usually takes a generation to change um, a national narrative from people winning local wins, such as removing police officers out of school, slashing police budgets, to people running experiments on how to actually confront harm and violence inside of their communities outside of the carceral states. There are hundreds of examples of incredible organizing work um, that is happening. I'm just thinking about the incredible work of trans women organizing to stop violence against them and many other examples of just impressive work. And the work is happening. The possibilities are there. People are laying the foundation of what people need to support. So I'll just close by saying again, fund us like you want us to win. Mm. Thank you, Em. So I just put in the chat. That was going to be my closing quote. <laughs> it's just such a good one, right? So thank you. Uh, thank you for preempting that. Gosh, thank you, panelists, for taking the time today, especially when there are just so many urgent priorities, particular in this moment. Um, thank you, thank you. And to the audience, thank you for your thoughtful engagement, your questions. I wish we could have gotten to all of them, um, but this is, this is part of a much longer and bigger and deeper conversation, a set of shifts that we're observing in the philanthropic sector. And we would love, and I know this is true for our panelists as well, to keep the conversation going, please reach out. Um, our panelists have curated a set of resources that I think we put in the, the chat. So please take a look at those links for further reading and, and research um, and reflection. Um, so thank you again. It's with immense gratitude that we wrap today. Um, be well and enjoy the rest of the forum.